Ah, oh, big jugs. How are we doing everyone? And welcome to my latest Q&A video, um, which is mainly going to be centred around my recent straight line mission across England. Uh, so I'll be answering all your burning questions about that. But also there will be a few other interesting questions answered as well. Thank you everyone who commented on the last vid with all your questions. Obviously I'm not going to be able to answer them all. Uh, but I am going to be answering 40 odd questions, which is quite a lot. I figured this time I would answer more questions, but try and ramble on less and answer them more concisely. So let's get straight into it. Question one is from Tom Smith and he says, Hey Tom, I was wondering, how much training did you have to do to prepare for this mission? Um, well, I've got a baseline level of fitness anyway, but to prepare for this mission, I needed to get my legs used to going up and down hills very quickly. So what I did, I went on the stair machine, the stair master in the gym and absolutely caned it. Often doing over a hundred flights of stairs at a time, getting quicker and quicker each time. And honestly, it's brutal, but it's the best thing you can possibly do for this. So I was pretty damn fit by the time the mission rolled around. Will there be more tenor in pocket-esque missions? Hell yes. In fact, I am going to be embarking on one in a couple of weeks' time. I won't give away the location of the next one just yet, but I do plan on taking that model and applying it to different countries. Maybe Ireland, maybe Italy, maybe France, etc, etc. Let me know if there's any sort of spin that I could put on it. I'm all open to ideas. Hi Tom, says Floyd McGee. My question to you is, did you ever consider Ireland when planning a straight line mission? I've thought about Ireland, but I don't think I'll ever be doing it because it's over 100 miles wide and it's just pure farmland. Chances of getting caught, very high, and I don't think the Irish farmers would take too kindly to an Englishman traipsing through their land. Lewis asks... Have you ever gotten into shit from your missions? Knock on the door from Plod, or perhaps people whose property you've had to go through on a mission contacting you? I'm guessing this guy never saw the episode of Scotland where the British Transport Police did actually knock on my door, um, asking me to take the video down, saying that people were copying it, crossing a railway track, that is. So that was a bad one, but I got away with that. Uh, ultimately in terms of punishment but apart from that nothing um, I made it into the Isle of Man newspapers for the encounter with that angry landowner but I never heard of him and I've never heard of any other farmer or landowner at all which is quite surprising actually Lee Art Lee wants to know how having a dedicated support team changes the straight line mission from both positive and negative. Well, that's it. There are pros and cons. Uh, the pros are morale doesn't drop that low because you've got company each and every night and presumably you're in the van as well. Warmth, again, great for morale. So for a mission like the England one, I don't know if I could have mentally coped with that camping out every night, being soaking wet um, and not having a support crew. I don't even know how I would even do that to be honest it's nigh on impossible so it's a it's a means to an end but then equally having a less supported stripped back mission as I've done in the past has its charms too feels more adventurous and less of a military operation but you're probably less likely to succeed so the support crew as I as I explained in the video was was a necess a necessity was a necessity it was a means to get the job done Hi Tom, says Sashaw. Do you plan on completing a mission with Welsh Greg? A lot of you have asked this. Well, Welsh Greg has entered a new chapter of his life um, where he's got himself a fantastic career in the climate change industry and he's living in Washington DC, funnily enough, um, around the corner from Jack. Adventures with Greg, if they happen at all, which I think they will, will be quite rare now. Um, just because of where we are in the world, our careers, family in my case, getting things to align will be hard. 
We did film an old school mission for Patreon a few months ago, and we have talked about an adventure that we, we want to do together soon, maybe in a year's time, which seems to be a kind of cross between how not to travel and tenor in my pocket, that sort of thing. We're gonna try and make that happen. But in terms of straight line missions, probably not. Hey Tom, what happened with the sketchy body bag in the middle of the forest? Um, look, a lot of people have made a bit of a stink about this. It, it was a joke, really. I mean, it might have been a body bag, but let's face it, 99% chance it was just one of those black plastic bags that have um, like agricultural waste or forestry waste, like compost or you sometimes see that sort of thing in the middle of the forest. So it probably wasn't a body bag. If someone wants to go and check, they're more than welcome. But if it is a body, I had nothing to do with it. All right, my line was 20 meters to the left. Will Russell, what clothing did you bring slash consider bringing on this mission? And how did it vary from previous missions? Yes, clothing, I wanna talk about this because I didn't really have time to explain a lot of it in the episodes themselves. For this mission, I wanted to move real quick in the farmland. So I was running a lot of the time. I was lightly jogging through the fields. And so I wore a lot of the time trail shoes, trail running shoes. I also wore gaiters, which for some reason I'd never worn before. They were absolutely revolutionary. Seal proof socks I wore every day because they, again, they keep water out of your foot for the most part. I also flicked between the camo bag with just not much stuff in it and a small ultra running bag. This ultra running bag just had a few bits of food, a few batteries and uh, the camel bag full of water. So I barely needed to stop. Clothing varied from day to day. Uh, warm underlayers made of merino wool with my camo stuff on the top. But it is worth mentioning that I did fuck up on that rainy day that cold, cold, rainy day, I should have had warm underlayers with a completely waterproof jacket and just sacrificed it. If it gets ripped, it gets ripped. Alex asks, did you always intend to do the mission across England or did you only ever consider that it was possible after doing Wales? Funnily enough, the first straight line mission I plotted out on Google Earth was probably a couple of years before the Wales one. I toyed around with it and it was England. But then when it inevitably dawned on me just how hard that would be, I moved to Wales. I thought, why not do Wales? It's half the distance and there's less farmland. So I picked Wales. And it's only recently after Wales was done that I started to think actually England might be possible. Right, the old classic, one of the most commonly asked questions and I've answered it quite a few times now but I'll answer it again why are you so scared of farmers no really I mean what's the worst that could happen um, you can read the whole comment there from this guy dank engine 8302 look people seem to think that I'm actually scared of farmers as in if I encountered one I would like quake in my boots it's not the farmers I'm scared of, it's the mission ending, okay? Try to understand this. If I'm in a field with a hedgerow that's quite hard to get over, some of them are really, they take a couple of minutes to get over without damaging them, and a quad bike races up towards me with an angry farmer in it, he's not gonna let me climb over that hedgerow. He will, if, if they're angry enough, they will grab me. That's not all farmers, I mean, the evidence suggests that one in four is probably going to be angry, based on evidence from mine and Archie and Adam's videos so far. Archie and Adam's approach is to just be a bit more relaxed and just walk through and, and if a farmer comes, talk to them. And it has worked at times, but then the one time it really did not work for them and they failed their Wales attempt because of it. I mean, the farmer literally pulled in front of them on the quad bike and blocked their path. I had a, an instance, which you, you must have seen with my brother Ben, where again, a farmer so angry hey! that he probably would 
physically stop you trying to climb a hedgerow. I mean, in the end, we managed to run away. But it's not the farmer I'm scared of. It's the deviation. It's the failure of the mission. Because if the farmer comes and I'm not attempting to burst through the hedgerow in his presence, I'm following him off his land. That could be 50 metres through a gate, but it's unlikely. It's more likely to be hundreds and hundreds of metres off down a track somewhere, mission over. So it might look like I'm in this constant state of paranoia and overthinking, but it does the job. Being cautious gets me, it got me through 16 miles of farmland on day one, um, completely unscathed, which was a real achievement, I thought. The other classic, why do I do them in the winter time? Wouldn't summer be better? Right, I've got five words for you. Crops, heat, Flies and other insects, hay fever to an extent, but most of all, foliage. Foliage and crops, they're the main things because I'm not going to trample a farmer's crops and they, they are pretty unavoidable in the summer. But the foliage, I mean, if you think it's bad in the winter, it's 10 times worse in the summer. So imagine having to get through a bramble patch, which is up here with stingy nettles, uh, flies everywhere you're absolutely roasting because you know you've got to wear the thorn proof clobber to get through it so you're almost passing out from the heat you've got you're sweating you've got flies biting you um, hey eyes puffed up from hay fever and you've been ripped to shreds by brambles stinging nettles and and hedgerows hedgerows I don't know if you've seen them in the summer but they're just green so you can't see through them, but they're full of spikes. So you wouldn't be able to, in the winter, you can see what to grab onto. In the summer, you can't. Now, quite a few of you have asked this. Are you able to see the distance of the traveled line compared to the original straight line? Yes. The straight line is 67.5 miles or 109 kilometers. On this mission, the walked line Bear in mind, this was the, wig the wiggliest one I've ever done, so the difference will be largest on this mission. 77.8 miles or 125 kilometers. That's quite a big difference, isn't it? But that's all the minute, constant wiggling around. Some of that will be signal, though. Alex Ellis asks, quite legitimately, why do you fist bump Verity? Right, yeah. Looking back, it does look odd that I just fist bump Verity. Ben and then Verity and then move on. My answer is, I don't, normally. I never fist bump Verity. But in the mission, try and imagine we are in this almost military state of mind, right? We're getting the job done. Of course, I hug Verity and whatnot off camera. But when I'm in that mission mode, we have to put our relationship aside in a way. And we're a team, so it's like... Okay, see you in half an hour. Dum, dum. Hugs will come later, but for now, we're in mission mode. That, I don't know, it's hard to explain. We're in mission mode. But yeah, it does look odd, I admit. Another highly asked question. Do you plan on doing another How Not to Travel Europe series? Maybe Eastern Europe, or Australia, or Canada, or something. Lots of people's favourite style. Um, it's going to be difficult now that I've got a baby, I have to admit, because the America one, for example, took a month. And also, Greg is not gonna have time to do anything like that again either. So neither me and Greg can spare anything close to the time that we had when we did America or Europe. However, I think it's feasible that down the line we both find the time at some point to do a two-weeker in, in, I don't know, two years, three years, four years time. So it's never say never. And I know it wouldn't be the same, but I could always do one on my own for a couple of weeks and Verity and my daughter could sort of meet me a, a couple of times along the way, maybe off camera. Never say never, but it's gonna be hard. How do you get started with straight line missioning? I would love to attempt one, but what sort of programs would I need, equipment, etc, etc, etc? I'm not gonna answer that because I made a whole video on it. Here it is, link in the description. It might be slightly out of date, I don't know.
but everything pretty much you need to know is there. Simon is asking me a bit of a parenting question here. How am I going to handle the separation between physical play and virtual play? Screens versus the outdoors. Whew. Now this is something me and Verity have talked about a hell of a lot because as most young mom and dads rightly say, there's not a lot you can do about screens because they are going to be a part of our lives. Kids use them in schools, etc., etc. That said, I, we want to be pretty darn strict. My children are going to be as outdoorsy as they can possibly be because I believe that nature and the outdoors is where we're meant to be. That is where our souls are the most connected. And we're lucky in that we will be flexible enough with our time to be able to spend lots of time out, outdoors with our children. Screen time is going to be very, very strict. You're all laughing at me. All the parents are laughing at me saying, oh, you wait, you wait. Right, next question. With how the field houses are less risk adverse, do you think being out in the wilderness on your own plays a large part in what you'd consider worth the risk? For me, the fallen tree section seems so sketchy solo versus immediately having someone there to help. Yes, 100%. I, di I didn't, I forgot to mention this in the line review video, but absolutely. Um, yeah, if I had someone there with me, as long as I knew that they were capable, um, it would have made a big difference. Then again, I have to caveat that by saying I did still take risks on my own. And maybe if I did have someone like Ben Cook with me or whoever it might be, I might actually be inclined to go, do you know what? I don't want you to get hurt in this situation. Whereas if I'm on my own, you know, it's just little old me getting hurt. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm responsible for me. Archie and Adam were very bold with their log climbing. But again, I have to mention that they were dry. If they were wet and they both went through together, they'd be equally stupid. So... Yes and no. Uh, yeah, definitely yes, but not as much as you, you might think. Cheesy Feet GeoGuessr, lovely, asks, Hey Tom, you have risked your life in many videos in order to reach your goal. What is the one thing you have encountered that you decided to play it safe, which must have been very hard for you to do, which looking back could may well have saved my life? Well, Cheesy, the obvious thing that springs to mind was the first obstacle, major obstacle, I ever came across on a straight line mission, which was the raging torrent, the river Tanat, at the start of my first Wales mission. I was really, really torn. I did think about trying to just, you know, dash across that. But the power of the water combined with the cold and the potential submerged branches scared me off. And while it was gutting to deviate 120 meters straight away, I'm very pleased that I did make that decision. Although I then risked my life on a rotten old bridge. So the sensibleness didn't last very long, did it? If YouTube hadn't have worked out, what would have been your dream job? I always dreamt of being a musician, a songwriter, a composer, a performer of my own songs. I used to chip away at that when I was sort of 18, 19, 20, all into my early 20s. But I think I was scared of that not working out and spent most of my time procrastinating, working dead-end jobs, and getting pissed and stoned. But, yeah, music. Right, this was something that was very commented in the actual episodes themselves. Why don't you wear some sort of eye protection for the forest bits? I'm always on edge waiting for you to get a sharp branch in the eye. Yes, let me clear this up. I have worn eye protection on these missions and I did bring goggles but they always fog up and I know what you're gonna say ski goggles don't fog up well I've worn ski goggles while skiing and they always fog up even like anti-fog ones and on the straight line missions I'm so hot and sweaty they would definitely steam up for me but someone sent me a link to this now that looks like it might do the job. So next time I'm barging through pines, which I hope isn't too soon, I'll get me one of them. And then you can all stop moaning. 
Right, this question kind of links back to the fallen tree safety issue. Um, what is your plan if something bad did happen in the fallen trees? Thank God it didn't happen. Yeah, if I had have slipped, cracked my head off something or impaled my leg on one of those spikes. Um, let's say I was conscious but unable to climb out. I have an SOS button on the side of the GPS which you have to take this protective casing off and press so you don't accidentally press it. Um, or I could, if I was able to text um, Verity using the satellite phone, I'd say this is my position, the coordinates automatically are sent to her. And a rescue party would, I guess, eventually come. But the problem is, they've got to climb through what I've climbed through to get to me. But then how do you get me out? How do you stretch me out of that? You can't. You'd have to get a helicopter to lift me out. So, <laughs> and all of that would take, let, let's say the helicopter comes after eight hours. What state am I in? What's my temperature like? Have I got hypothermia? Well, if it was on that one day, definitely I would have succumbed to hypothermia. So yeah, it would not have been good. And that's with a satellite phone. Without one, pff, fucked. What was your plan if you encountered a hostile farmer? Would you bribe them to trespass to save the mission? Right, I had an order of things that I was gonna say. Different levels. So first of all, just mate, this is what I'm doing. It sounds a bit mad, but please, like, I'm not damaging any hedgerows, like, is there any chance you let me through? If it's like, no, no chance, I would then move to, this is my third attempt, this means the world to me, um, blah, 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 blah. No, still don't care, okay, is there anything I can do? I'll, I'll work on your farm for a week. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some money for some farming equipment, you know, if you can just lift, maybe lift me over the hedge with your tractor. Is there some sort of arrangement we can come to, basically? So yeah, um, bribing. Why not? As a last resort, it's better than failing. So yes, to answer your question. And then if they said no to bribing, I was, the next level was literally get down on my knees and beg. You know, like, mate, you're about to see a grown man beg. It is hard to imagine that none of that would work. But then when you look back at how angry that Welsh farmer was, I don't know. I think he was beyond bribing, begging, anything. Why don't you plan your food intake more seriously? I always see you munching on candies. That is a big no-no. Um, you're wrong, basically. Um, sweets sometimes are exactly what you need on this sort of thing. I'm burning through calories really, really quickly. Um, sweets can be a lifesaver. They're, they're, you don't want to live off them. So some people think that because they see me eating sweets sometimes as I'm walking, that that's all I eat. You can't just live off sweets, but sometimes, especially with me, my sugar level drops because I've just expended too much calories and I need it, it totally sorts me out. Of course, along with that, I eat substantial food. Every night I had, you know, two or three bowls of pasta with tuna in there for protein, mayonnaise for fat, you know, all I really need on this mission is carbs in the day, protein at night to help with my muscles, and fat whenever. Um, I don't really need to be having like vegetables or nutrient, you know, nutrient rich things like that. I might munch on some jerky or some salami for a bit of protein. In the morning, I would have a massive flapjack, huge flapjack, which is just full of uh, slow burning calories. I'm not the most clued up with nutrition, but I'm not as clueless as some of you think when it comes to um, food out on the trail. Ben Cook has more knowledge because he's done more ultra marathons. Um, but to be honest, we were both pretty much in agreement about what food I should eat. Although judging by what he ate the whole time on the mission, uh, seven full English breakfasts in a row, you'd be forgiven for thinking otherwise. Bit of a different question here. Would you be interested in commentating at the GeoGuessr World Cup? I'm sure they would love to have you. Uh, they did ask me to do that. They came to me first, apparently. Um, but I turned it down because I'm just not that immersed in the GeoGuessr world anymore. Much better to have someone like Zigzag or Rainbolt who actually knows 
what they're talking about at all times. And I know I could be the sort of more clueless host of the two alongside a rain bolt or a zigzag, um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't worth it for me. It would take out a lot of time out of my busy schedule, uh, editing videos and, and whatnot as well. At what point in the mission did you have the highest morale and at what point did you have the lowest morale? Lowest point was day two um, when I was really cold, really wet and the short bushy pine was just endless and I just had obviously so much distance to do on the mission. It just gets to you and that was the moment when I had to really perk myself up by going, come on, you got this which sounds ridiculous, but it really does, it does work. So that must have been the lowest point for me to have to do that. Highest was when the sun was rising in the final third of Otterburn firing range. I knew I was gonna get through it. Chances of success for the mission, way, way higher. Um, walking on just grass, which felt like heaven. About to meet up with Ben and Verity. Uh, beautiful scenery. Unforgettable high. Um, but as I've said so many times before, it only feels that good because you've had those lows. John Cromp kindly asks, how is everything going with the new kid? Very well, thanks John. She's perfectly healthy and has already enriched our lives no end. Do you listen to music on these adventures? If you don't, you are a true madman. Uh, well, you've reinforced what I already thought. I am a madman. No, I don't listen to me. I've thought about it, but you kind of need to be concentrating all the time. I mean, maybe it would be possible in the forests or on the moors, but I'm always talking to the camera. So, no, there's just no chance, really. But to be honest, it's fine because that's part of being at one with nature. The sounds of nature the birds, the silence. That's all part of it. Try it, everyone. You might feel bored at first, but it's a very peaceful place. Are you wanting to create more music? And if so, can we expect it to be a sequel to your 16-bit adventure album? I am thinking of doing another 16-bit album at some point in the future, but you might be pleased to know that I am actually releasing an album, a normal album, with me singing and playing all the instruments. It's currently being mastered, and it should be released in, I don't know, a month or so. Maybe two months. It's, it's taken longer than it, than it ought to have, but um, we're nearly there. Have you considered just doing and recording a multi-day hike? Just out and about in nature, doing your thing, camping, surviving, and yeah, just chilled, basically. Um, yes, I'm doing that next week, and it's gonna be available on the $4 tier of Patreon. Um, me and Ben Cook are gonna work our way through the mystical lands of Snowdonia, uh, very northern mountainous parts of Wales. We're gonna find some great camping spots, make some campfires, have some tots of whiskey and great conversations and explore mystical forests and mountains. That should be available in early to mid-September. I don't know exactly when. Uh, so if you are interested in watching that, that might be the time to sign up and just watch all the other adventures on there at the same time. Maybe I'll do the same thing for YouTube at some point. No doubt I will at some point as I get older. Have you ever had a straight line mission you started but didn't finish and never uploaded it to YouTube? No. But I have considered that as a plan. Any plans for another No Roads Challenge? Asks James. Uh, yes, that's all I'll say. Yes, I won't tell you which cities, but I do have one planned. And I need to get these done sooner rather than later because they are a bit naughty, aren't they? And also other people might beat me to it. What's the biggest quarrel you had with Verity and Ben during the England mission and what was it about? No quarrels, guys. We we get on really well. Um, I did get very angry one morning because my gator cord tied itself in a knot, which was impossible to untie. And I just wanted to get going in the morning and I got very, very worked up with that. So I sometimes do 
get pissed off, but it's either with myself or just stuff. Right, Brypey has an interesting question. You started the line seemingly quite far inland. Is this a technical cheat? Should you have gone truly from coast to coast, beach to beach? Um, just a question, not a criticism. Right, the way I've always done it is whatever is tidal, that's where I've started. Sometimes it doesn't look very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you know, a lot of people criticise me in Norway for finishing at a fjord instead of going over the fjord and more mountains to the actual North Sea. But a fjord is the coast. And in this case, the estuary, I, I, I have to admit, it, it doesn't look great in this case. Maybe I should have started a bit further west, but that spot where I started is tidal. I spoke to um, multiple local fishermen on a Facebook group uh, called Border Esque Fishing. And I, I asked the, the guy who runs it actually, and he said that the, the tide regularly goes way past that spot actually. Um, it goes another mile further up. Um, and I, I've seen videos of the tide coming past further upstream than that. So it counts, but I, I accept what you're saying. It's probably not the ideal place to start. Shari Hartz reckons I'm a natural storyteller and wants to know if I've always had a natural knack for s telling a story or if it's something I've had to develop as I've edited my videos. Um, English was always my strong point, creative writing. Um, that was my strongest subject at school. Uh, my mom was an English teacher. And yeah, throughout my life, I've always really valued storytelling. It's an art, it's a skill, and I've always endeavored to be good at it. And when it came to writing up the uh, narration for my first ever mission, the Wales mission, it became obvious to me as I was writing it that, wait, no, you can make this funnier, you can make this better, you can make this more poignant, or whatever it might be. So I'd do a draft and I'd do another draft and actually, you've missed an opportunity for a joke here, you can make it even funnier. And when I saw the reaction to it, I was like, okay, that works. You, you know, there's no end to how far you can go with this, really. The world's your oyster. So that reinforced my belief uh, that it was a powerful tool. And I've tried my best to utilize that tool ever since. But it's just about going over it again and again and perfecting it and just looking for opportunities to improve it. John Johnson here is one of quite a few people who have asked about ticks. How do you not get eaten up by ticks? I'll be totally honest with you, I never even considered ticks until probably three or four missions in. I wasn't really aware of how bad they were. I didn't think necessarily that they existed in Britain, but they do. They're just not quite as dangerous as Europe, as in mainland Europe. I always cover my legs quite well, but to be honest, I haven't given them a thought while I've been on a mission. I've forgotten about them every single time. Boring answer. But if I were to do a mission in like Sweden or something, um, I would seriously think about that because the, the implications, some of the diseases you can get can be life ending, can't they? Last couple guys, and this is top five asked questions. Would you ever consider doing a straight line in the USA? Not the entire country, obviously, but perhaps a state. Um, I've thought about this. I've looked on the map. And I think it's possible to do maybe the panhandle of Idaho, uh, where it's much wilder and the property is less um, fiercely guarded, I guess. But then there would be other issues, wildlife, cougars, wolves, bears, etc., which I'm really not used to that shit and would scare me, as well as just ridiculously big mountains and remote landscapes. Um, I think Delaware is possible. I think some of these smaller ones are possible, but then you've got the the issue of fiercely protected land. Um, people with guns. I don't think I'd actually get shot, but it would be maybe more trouble than it would be worth, especially when you consider flying over there and everything. Uh, the legal implications could be quite bad. I might be banned from the country, and my family wouldn't let me do it anyway. I don't think so. Not looking likely. And finally, we end with this question by Star Shooter. 
Why do you do what you do? <laughs> what really drives you to make adventure style content? Fame? To inspire? Firstly, I've got to admit that accolades and records were a big driving force behind some of the bigger missions that I've done recently. Uh, but those aside, it goes like this. At the top, I love doing it. Going on adventures, I find it so rewarding and fulfilling and fun. And I get paid for it, right? I'm earning a living from doing the thing that I love the most. Or one of the things I love doing the most. So that, that there, that, that's the main crux of it. But also a big part of it is to inspire. That's what makes it really rewarding. I like to think though that it's um, a two-way street. It's a win-win situation for all of us. And long may it continue. I've got loads more ideas. Um, both for Patreon and for YouTube. I'm hoping now that I've got more editor help, that I can spend more time out on the field, so to speak, and less time editing. And although I do plan to spend a bit more time with my family because it's in increased in size, I actually think that there'll be more adventures for you all to watch going forward. Anyway, guys, that brings us to the end of this Q&A. I have no idea how long that was. I tried my best to keep it concise. Thank you so much for watching. Sorry if I missed your question. Take it easy, everyone. Geodetective should be next. So I'll see you for that one.